Welcome to Adeptus On Air, the show where we examine how individuals and companies make decisions that drive their business and personal success. Each week, we connect with notable professionals who pull back the curtain on the industries that Adeptus has been on the cutting edge of for the last 30 years, including music, sports, and entertainment, as well as new emerging markets. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to another episode of Adeptus on Air. I am again your host, Mike Hoffman, and today I am joined by Sean Gold. Sean, how you doing today? I'm good. Thank you for having me. No, I, I appreciate you coming on. So uh, let me read a little bio on you here. Hopefully I get this all right. Uh, Sean is a lifelong entrepreneur, two-time best-selling author, international speaker, advisor, and a super connect up to startups and standouts, a Jeopardy contestant, which we definitely want to talk about, and a screenwriter, executive producer. Did I get that pretty good? Yeah, it sounds exhausting when you say it. I did all that? You did all that? Well, you know, wow, okay. if so, someone has given me some very wrong information, <laughs> yeah. so I have a major problem if you didn't do it. <laughs> yeah, I uh, I did. It's, uh, always, it's always different when someone else says it, but yes, uh, correct on all, all fronts. All right, good, good. All right, well, let's get to the easy stuff first and the fun stuff. Talk to me about Jeopardy. Uh, what is, what would you like to know? Well, how how'd we do? Um, I was winning until I, I sunk my winning my uh my lead on a daily double. Don't make my mistake. Montreal is an island. It's a hundred percent an island. I learned that the hard way in front of ten million people. Uh, oh, so geez. yeah, it's uh, and it kind of annoyed me because I was the only one in the final Jeopardy. But uh, that's the way you go. You don't got a lot of time to calculate your options. And right, uh, right. I studied for quite a long time. I knew a lot and um. Montreal being an island never came up in any of my materials. So it's, it sure. comes down to luck. It really comes so down you to like you studying. Know. I've always wondered this. Obviously, the people that go on there and obviously, including yourself, just have a vast wealth of knowledge. I mean, clearly. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, if I'm watching the show, if I'm getting 10% of the questions right, I'm like, oh, I'm having a good day. And obviously, the people that are on there are getting a much higher percentage. So you indicated that you studied. Mm -hmm. So how do you study for something where the topic could be absolutely anything? You have to study anything. <laughs> I yeah. mean, that's it's essentially you have to really brush up on geography, culture, mathematics, presidents, vice presidents, fun facts. I mean, everything. You just you don't know what you're going to encounter until you get there. It could be periodic table. It could be 18th century Europe. I mean, you just yeah. you don't know. So you just you kind of have to have a large breadth of knowledge um which i do and my weak points i just showed up but you study everything and and you hope it clicks because you only have a few seconds to recall it and and, right. and buzz in with it um but yeah i um they i mean i studied for a month they give you 30 day notice to appear on the show so as okay. soon as i got the call i chilled that day and then immediately the next day i just stopped everything i was doing and mm -hmm. started studying like eight to twelve hours a day um just everything pouring over um, past Jeopardy episodes, trivia, test banks, history, creating my own study guides, yeah. all that stuff. Um, uh, my brain was kind of like Swiss cheese, you know. So, <laughs> so looking back after you did it, mm -hmm. do you feel that some of the stuff you studied that maybe you didn't know before you studied actually appeared, or did you looking back was that month? No, nah, I got nothing. Um, out of yes and no. Some of it appeared and some of it didn't. Some of it mm -hmm. I already knew, but some of it definitely appeared. Um, it, what's irritating is it sticks with me forever now. So now when I watch it, because I still watch it every night or watch any trivia show, I know more of the, the answers because I studied it and it's just stuck. It's uh, yeah. I have a photographic memory, so a lot of things are stuck in my mind. Um, so, yeah. And then um, considering doing Pop Culture Jeopardy, the spinoff, but I don't really know much about pop culture. I have the study guide prepared. I had a researcher prepare it for me. It is teams, so I formulated the team. but we're still trying to figure out the best time for us to take the test to do it. Yeah. Just because you have to really like, I'm pretty busy right now. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if I have it in me to take like a month off to really right. study and really, and I don't know if my team, you know, who are also very, you know, educated and knowledgeable in, in their areas. I don't know if they have enough time to take, you know, a month off uh, mm -hmm. between the family obligations, work obligations to really study because that's, you got to come prepared. It can't be something you do like for an hour a night. You really have to go through it and, 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 you know, it's almost no, like no, no, the CPA exam or the bar. You have a test coming up. Yeah. 
I mean, essentially, I mean, I was, I've never studied that hard for anything in my life. And I only did it after like the, the tests are fine. I passed the Jeopardy test, no problem. But to be on, to actually prepare for the show, I just, I studied just nonstop because again, you don't know what could be on there. And uh, I got some really random categories that day, but it was just stuff that, that there's so much just information out there that even if I think you study for a year, there's still yeah. going to be stuff you don't know. There's still sure. going to be stuff that, you know, that is so minute and so minor that unless like you visited that place or you grew up in that area, you would not know who like the hometown hero of like, you know, Hoboken is. Right. Okay. Like it's just very, yeah. like it would never come up. Um, so it's, 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 it really comes down to luck a lot of the time. Who is Frank Sinatra? Yo, know, that's, I mean, that'd be like an easy one, but no, I don't know. I don't, I don't, like, I just, right? like, it's, it's, it's could have been just like, like, yeah. like random stuff like that, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah. go through it. And it's like, if you don't know your 1930s right. dance crazes, you know, it's like, you're, you're out. Did um, you ever see the movie White Men Can't Jump? Of course. So when she was studying that category, what, I think it was like foods that begin with Q. And then sure <laughs> enough, it was a, a category. Yeah. Yeah. It's, again, it's so random. Yeah. And it's it just it's it really comes down to luck. But I tell everyone that because everyone always asks me, I say, listen, if you really want to do it, do it. There's nothing stopping you from doing it. And just the acceptance rate is like probably one of the most like exclusive acceptance rates of anything. Mm -hmm. More exclusive than any college startup accelerator yeah, yeah. or anything. Um, it's usually like I mean, at least when I did it, but they usually say it's the same because I still keep in touch with a lot of like contestants and part of these like former contestant groups. Mm -hmm. um, it's like. 80,000 plus people like apply every year and out of the 80,000 like 300 are picked to go yeah. on the show and to Good. do that you have to pass three tests mm -hmm. plus a fake game the audition like you know it's not just like oh let's do it it's it's yeah. really really difficult so and people try for years i mean people try for like decades to get on the show um you know mine was relatively quick so it's just uh, it's a cool thing so I tell everyone do it do it cuz it's a uh, it's a hard thing to pull off and I was told you have an interesting Alex Trebek story. Yeah, I'm the last contestant to high five him on air. Really? Twice, but one of them got cut off. Yeah, yeah. My uh, my during the story when he does the interview, we did the high five, and then during the credits, we did mm -hmm. the high five. We were just hanging out, laughing. It was a uh, super cool dude. I mean, yeah. it was like again one of those things to be like, I'm gonna go on the air and hang with Alex Trebek. You know, add him to my list of uh, celebrity cool stuff I've done. You yeah. know, um, but yeah, it was. Uh, it, it was just, it was one of those things where, again, if you really want to do it, because a lot of people want to do stuff, but nobody ever follows through on it. Yeah, you're right. And this is one of those things that, like, you really want to do it. Like, no one's going to do it for you. And you have to really prepare yourself to do it. And I was not, like, a trivia person by any means. I never did quiz ball. If I walked right. into a bar and someone was doing trivia in the bar, I'd left the bar. Right. I mean, it wasn't like, let me stay here. It's, this yeah. is fun. Like, I never stayed in and played trivia. You mm -hmm. know, it was nothing like that. It was, I had a lot of knowledge. And I'm, it's easy for me to soak up knowledge. It's easy for me to read and remember right. stuff and retain it. So, yeah. Well, it's always good to get those bucket list items. Actually, a few of them checked. So that's pretty. Hundred percent. That's a pretty cool experience, and obviously, some as you said, a story to talk about kind of forever. So, yeah, well, one of many. Yeah, yeah, one of more. Well, that's good. One of many. And and based upon your bio here, obviously, there's a bunch of different stuff. So, you know, let, let's kind of get to it. So, I'm going to guess. Obviously, you know, you're a two-time best-selling author. So, I'm going to guess these books have something to do with kind of what you do. So why don't you kind of talk about the main gist of, you know, how you're spending your days and kind of how it led also down the road to these books? I mean, um, every day is a new adventure for me. So I've been an entrepreneur my whole life. Mm -hmm. So it really depends on the day and what I'm doing. Right now in the present, I'm focused a lot working with startups, working with a lot of executives, doing everything from pitch decks to content to fundraising to strategy, mm -hmm. um, everything non-technical. And then outside of that, leading to the books, my biggest entrepreneur endeavor before what I'm doing now was marketing and promoting like nightclubs uh, here in Miami. So I spent okay. almost two decades doing it, started when I was like 16, 17, mm -hmm. um, became a fixture in the scene. And that's what really led to like the books because I was, you know, just a kid throwing parties, but my clients were celebrities and athletes and pop culture figures and high net worth individuals in mm -hmm. addition to like everybody else. and. Um, you know, everyone always kept saying, you should write a book. You should write a book. Yeah. So I did. <laughs> I wrote, I wrote four and then, uh, and then two of them, be, uh, you know, became both number one in entrepreneurship on Amazon. I was in top 25 authors, um, you know, for a while there. Um, 
So it was, it was really cool. So, you know, the books, again, they're, I haven't written the book in a while. I mean, I've ghostwritten some stuff as of late for clients, mm -hmm. but for my own personal stuff, my switch has been more to content side of like screenplays, mm -hmm. um, graphic novels, things, things that are much easier than writing a book. They're more fun yeah, and yeah. easier than, than doing a book. Um, just because it's like, all right, I still want to write books, but it's a world that doesn't read anymore, unfortunately. So yeah, my right. whole thing is, is I rather, do stuff that I want to spend my time doing. And like the, the screenplay stuff is definitely something that, you know, I'm self-taught. I have a, a deal with a producer. I have a Netflix director attached to one of my projects or attaching talent, mm -hmm. like all that stuff. Um, so it's, it's a very challenging thing to do, but that's like, I want to challenge myself. So it really yeah. depends. I mean, cool. the last one I did for, I mean, everything's been for clients. Um, the last screenplay I did, was for a client of mine that I helped just kind of structure and rewrite the dialogue, kind of do the rewrite mm -hmm. of, and that's for a major Hollywood producer. Can't say who, but um, so that's something I did. And then um, content wise, I mean, I've got so many articles online on everything from startups to, you know, venture capital to, to mm -hmm. whatever the case may be, uh, whatever people need done. So I'm, I'm always writing every day. It's like, there's always, there's always words being taken from the mind to, to paper. right on the paper. Mm -hmm. So how did you come from being like a 16 or 17 year old guy promoting nightclubs to, you know, a promoter for the stars and these high net worth individuals? I mean, what was that evolution? Was it just a word of mouth? Like, how did you, it was, it was all word of a mouth. lot of people try doing what you're doing. So how did you mm -hmm. make it work? For me, it was more of like destiny. That's what I wanted to do. So like, okay. When you, when you, when you would have that kind of ideal of what you truly want to do, the obstacles that would stop everyone else don't stop you. Where people see walls, you see stepping stones. Mm -hmm. So, um, I was in it for just a long time and it was all word of mouth. And I would, the, the best way to describe it is that my success in that industry was because I took the nights nobody wanted to go out at the places nobody wanted to go for the mm -hmm. money nobody else would accept. Yeah. That was it. And that's how I mm -hmm. kind of built, you know, a crowd one person at a time. Mm -hmm. um, and that led first, it was mostly focused on my, my school, University of Miami, which I chose to basically do and go there over, throw, over another better school to throw parties. That's what I wanted to do. Um, so I did that and it was started with college kids and then it expanded. And then I just kind of held down the co that college scene for years and everyone else, it was kind of revolving door. It was nice because I would do the like freshman welcome parties or as we call them, the disorientation. Mm -hmm. um, and then for four years, they would always come to me and then they would graduate. I do the graduation party and then they'd either go to, you know, a law school or med school, MBA, whatever the case may be. They'd stick around or they'd go and they'd go off in the, into the workforce and then they would grow and they would come back. So then it yeah. became instead of, oh, my friends are visiting for spring break. It's like, well, my boss wants to go out or my CEO wants mm -hmm. to go out or my manager. So then it became, you know, OK, now I'm taking out, you know, these C-suite executives of publicly traded companies. And now I'm mm -hmm. taking out government officials and now I'm taking out all this. And it was just pretty wild. I mean, and again, I did it for so long that I, I held down a, the entire millennial generation. You know, like I, I held them down a little bit of Gen Z, but not so much. And um, yeah, that's that was just my only like real thing for, for all those years. Like I, I did other stuff. I got into consulting and all that, but it was more like nightlife because that's what I was known for. I mean, I, I built it to the point where I never like spent a dollar on ads. I never did any. Like, I never did all the stuff that, you know, oh, we need to spend yeah. $20,000 a month, like nothing. It was all just like I got to the point that. I had the connections, I had the people, and I would just wake up and get text messages from all over the world of people coming to Miami that wanted to get a, get in or get a table and whatever the case may be. And then they started working. We had a lot of cool brand launches. So the best events I did besides like the really private ones were these, you know, brand launches and brand experiences and activations for like Absolute, Budweiser, Vouv Clico, where they would have giant budgets and we would take over like a penthouse or we take over an entire hotel pool, the open mm -hmm. bar, it'd be food. You had to be on the guest list. There'd be a celebrity host. Right. It would be in the randomly on a Thursday afternoon, like all that stuff. And that's, mm -hmm. that's what I was doing. I mean, it was just like, I would be in class and I would get a text message saying, Hey, we have a celebrity football game on the beach. We need a good crowd. And these are all the football players and NFLs. Do you want to do it? It's this Wednesday. I said, yeah. 
you know, just hop on and do it. Um, cause things like that, like if you, if it's in the middle of like the week, most people are working, but right. if you have like 21 year olds, 22 year olds, 23 year olds, they're looking for something cool to do. So they always hit me up. So, um, so yeah, I mean, again, I did it for years and, uh, that was, that was just my jam. And, and it worked for you. Then you, you, you've obviously moved on to, uh, other things. So who named you the, uh, nightlife ninja? Me. Oh, <laughs> that was self, <laughs> self crowned. Um, but it was just kind of a thing because I'd walk people in and then I would disappear. It'd be like, mm-hmm. you know, like Batman where they would be yeah. talking, they turn around, I'd be gone. And then I would reappear randomly and they just feel like you're like a ninja. You yeah, know? yeah. That was that was my favorite moniker. I mean, the other stuff was like I was the South Beach kid. That was the thing because everyone was like, You're that South Beach kid because you're always promoting and you're always out. Mm-hmm. But the ninja was more um more my style. So yeah, yeah. so that's uh uh, so now it's just former nightlife ninja. Everybody likes that. So that's uh, and, and I do mean former. I haven't been in the club in years. I have no intention of going back. So how did right, so how do you then transition from that to as you said, you're now doing some consulting work for CEOs because obviously that seems like a pretty major shift. So yeah, did, it, it's um, it came gradually. I mean, so a lot of people I was bringing out with me, you know, they recognized I was, you know more intelligent than everyone else in that business, so to speak, mm-hmm. because I had a degree, I was doing the books, I was always, you know, I was yep. speaking on different subjects and whatnot. I was lecturing at different universities. So, you know, they wanted to work with me. They bring me into their startups and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'd help them with startups. I had a vast networks. So people wanted to get connected to the right people. Um, and then outside of that, like it was when I left nightlife and started doing more of the consulting and then Throughout the like pandemic, I was doing a lot of virtual networking and got involved more on the venture capital side. Um, so again, gave myself another education, which is, is ongoing. It never ends on venture capital, on private equity, all that mm-hmm. um, to the point now where, you know, I'm a partner in a, in a fund. We do emerging markets. We've done some SPVs into late stage companies. We're doing some work with secondaries um, and I'm pretty much applied my kind of marketing prowess from nightlife to venture capital and startups, which is why, like, you know, I have a lot of articles out there that come up on Google. I'm always speaking at different accelerators or mentoring and all that just because, you know, I I spent years doing it and and really working with so many different companies and seeing what they were doing wrong and how to learn from that and all all that. So, yeah, it was um, it wasn't an overnight switch. It was a very, you know, gradual. It took years for one to learn. And two, to actually apply that knowledge to obtain clients and work with, you know, real organizations and work with late stage companies and mm-hmm. work with funds and all of that. Um, you know, so it does take years. And I feel like a lot of people yeah. just think that it's, um, you know, it's overnight. It's right. just like, OK, next week I'm doing this. I mean, you can. It just but as far as doing something that's actually profitable and actually yeah. opens doors mm-hmm. and actually, you know, moves the needle. It, it's not overnight. It never is. So when you when you made the comment before that, you know, you were looking at businesses to see kind of what they were doing right, what they were doing wrong. Did you kind of notice, obviously, there's exceptions to what I'm about to say, a common theme of something that a lot of these businesses were doing wrong? Like it was pretty easy mm-hmm. to say, OK, there's a pattern here on how people are running these businesses. Um, seeing as they're all startups. Yeah, of course. The pattern is that 99 percent of startups fail. And that's because 99 percent of startup founders don't know what they're doing. Right. And uh, one of the things that I discovered is that there was no one really out there telling it like how it is, mm-hmm. you know, because everyone likes to be like, oh, you're going to do great. You're going to be next Steve Jobs and let's focus on this. And I'm just like, this is the dumbest thing ever. Right. I was like, you have no core competency to make to go from zero to one point A right. to point B. You're not yeah. going to be able to raise five million dollars on your idea. That's AI for ice cream. Right. It's yeah. not going to happen. Um, so that kind of like turned a lot of heads because people was just like, I love what you write and I love how you tell it how it is. And I love how, you Mm -hmm. know, you, you really tell people what they need to know. Um, and it's just like, that, you know, it comes from the nightlife. It comes from being at the best clubs in the world at the doors and selecting who can come in and who can't and seeing how like the system worked and whatnot. Um, it's the same thing. It's the same thing in venture. It's the same thing with startups. Um, and I feel like the, the bluntness is a competitive advantage. Just because I'll tell them, like, listen, it's not for me. This isn't going to work. This makes no sense. And if people don't agree, it's fine. I'm not the one that's raising millions of dollars. <laughs> you know, they right, are. Right, right. So it's, yeah. uh, I'm, I just try to offer the help from, you know, what I've worked with. And I've worked with probably over 50 startups. 
Um, I have my partners in the fund, which again, come from traditional finance and hedge funds and all that. I mean, I, I just put the fun in fun, you know, that's it. Um, they actually are the, 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 the ones with the numbers and the brains behind it. So, you know, I can bring them in and we can analyze it and really structure something to help them out. Um, and it, it really just, it's hard to find really exceptional founders and it's hard to find really exceptional startups. Um, and I think that's a just common problem in the industry. Yeah. So, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's for everybody. That's why so few get funded. And that's why even the ones that do get funded, so few of them actually have a successful exit because it's so difficult. Yeah. Cause I, cause I think what happens is a lot of these people who are, at least in my opinion, who are starting these startups, they're brilliant. They have great ideas, but they're not business owners and they don't have that experience. So you can mm -hmm. have a great idea, but if you don't know how to, like you said, get the funding, you don't know how to, prom whether it's promote it, market it, you know, build it up and so forth. You can have the best idea in the world, but if you don't know what to do with it, you don't know what to do with it. Yeah. There's, they don't know how to execute. That's a big right. thing. It's just like, you know, it's just, there's a lot of like cockiness that doesn't have anything to back it up. Yeah. You know? And the and problem is because they're a startup, a lot of them are probably hesitant to spend the money. Mm -hmm. Some do was to get someone like you or to get, a CEO, a CFO or someone like that in there to help make the financial decisions because they can't afford it because they are a startup. Yeah. I mean, well, that's, uh, here's the thing. If you really want to do something, you'll do it. If not, you'll make an excuse. And yeah. the problem is that most of them just want to raise millions of dollars on the idea. And they want, for some reason, me to help them raise millions of dollars on mm -hmm. nothing, which is not going to do. And then once they have the millions of dollars, then they could hire someone like me. So it just, it doesn't right. work. It just the the real people that I've worked with that actually scale and know what they're doing, they're not going to, you know, belittle or begrudge a few thousand dollars to get from point A to point B. You know, yeah. they just won't. Uh, most other people just and, and it's not it, it's not like a specific group of people. I've seen it across Gen Z to boomers that just people mm -hmm. don't want to they don't want to do it. And it's like, OK, well, it's, someone's going to be disappointed. It's not going to be yeah. me. Because right. I could always find another client to work with, Correct. Um, but they can't find another me. So, um, you know, and again, I've, I've done this long enough to to see there's never been a simple, a single startup that I've said no to, or this isn't going to work, or you're not going to raise. They've never, mm -hmm. no one's ever gone on to prove me wrong. I'm still waiting for the day that someone's going to come on and prove me wrong. And I hope they do. But right. so far, not yet. So far, it's it's the same stuff. So Sometimes, though, know. a startup just becomes successful because it becomes successful. It doesn't mm -hmm. become successful because of all the right decisions an owner or developer made. Sometimes it's just such a good item that despite what they did, they still became successful. So yeah, that I mean, what, that comes what, back to you and says, I did it. It wasn't because they did something right. It was just maybe because they didn't do something really, really wrong. <laughs> it, it could be. It hasn't happened yet. <laughs> That's yeah. what I'm saying. I'm, I'm waiting. I'm waiting for it yeah. to be like. In 2021, you told me this wasn't going to work. Well, now it's 2024, and we've raised seven million dollars. Like, it hasn't happened yet. I'm waiting for it. I hope they do. Yeah. Um, I'll champion them, but I don't. Um, I haven't seen it yet. And again, most of the people I've talked to years ago, because startups are a long journey. Um, the whole. I mean, if you're not going to be able to spend five to ten plus years on something, then don't do it. Um, and a lot of people I met just they just fell off. They just never did it. It was just they switched, they pivoted because that was it. So, you know, and I told them this isn't going to work. You really have to figure this out. You have to have a customer base and you have to, you know, the like common sense business stuff. And I feel like most people are just, you know, they're on the bandwagon for what's hot. They're on the bandwagon that if they can do something that's trending, it's going to raise and going to be billionaires. I mean, I've heard it all before and I, and I hear it every day yeah. and it keeps getting funnier every time I hear it. So, yeah, that's it's part of why every day is a new adventure. So moving on a little bit, talk to me about the uh, the utopian journey. Yeah, so to be honest, it's been a few months since I delved into it just because my brain has been focused on other things. But I started it as a pandemic project and grew it into a sub stack of almost like 30,000 readers of uh, wow. based on a graphic novel concept of mine, just on, you know, being mentally stronger, mentally more resilient, what to focus on uh, in an ever changing world. Um, I think I probably have over 500,000 words that I wrote for it. Um, there's a ton of wow. content out there with it. So that's why I'm a little like I'm focused on writing other content because I feel like in my mind, I'm like, it's enough. <laughs> like it's yeah. it's enough. Um, but yeah, it won, it won uh, SDG award from European Tech Consortium. I worked with King's College 
London, uh, doing a guest blog post on it. I worked with, uh, I guess, lectured at the MBA program at Georgetown and ethical leadership. Um, yeah, it, it was just really cool. It was just something that it, you know, it, it, it went across boundaries and borders and people really dug it. So it was just something that I was really passionate about, which I still am at the time. It just, I had more time to focus on that than I do now, just because I have other stuff in the pipeline that I'm involved with that, yeah. um, your brain and mind can't stretch and or break, but it can get tired. <laughs> so it's, yeah. it's really, you have to be able to have that, that voraciousness to read and write, um, either focusing on something like a project like that, or it's going to be focused on like another project that I'm doing, or it's going to be focused on the multiple client projects mm -hmm. I'm working with. So it's, um, you know, you, you have to make kind of a choice, you know, of what to focus on. Um, but yeah. it's still cool. It's something I'm really proud of. Something that again did on my own. Uh, um, read a ton of books, got extremely educated from it, uh, and I put that to use. Um, you know, kind of in, in my day to day, depending on the circumstance. So you obviously are someone who's done a bunch of different things. Are you working on anything now that I don't know about? Yeah, I mean, um, we have an animated project that we're working on. Um, waiting on a very, very impressive strategic partner to sign with us that we're in negotiations with. Um, but it'll be short form animated content focused mm -hmm. on a lot of different people, but the whole focus is like, um, overcoming obstacles. So mm -hmm. we have, uh, you know, professional athletes that are going to be featured, um, people from entrepreneurship, venture, um, executives all across the spectrum. Mm -hmm. Um, so we're doing that. I'm, ex I'm not only starring in an episode, but executive producing it. Nice. Um, I, again, I have my film projects. Um, we're working on a ton of different companies, ton of different fun stuff. Um, yeah, it just, every day is a new adventure. It, it really depends on what I wake up and what the emails and text messages say. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, there's, there's always something popping, which is exciting. It's, uh, it's much better to have something to look forward to and to wake up and see what's happening as opposed to being like, all right, um, nothing's happening. It's all the same. It's yeah, same every day. It's boring. It's not good. Is there something you haven't tapped into that in the back of your mind, like, wow, that's something I'd like to give a go at sometimes at some point in my life? Um, yes and no. I mean, I've always been like a go getter, so I want to mm -hmm. go after what I want. Um, I'm probably going to do my own graphic novel on Kickstarter. I'm just okay. like figuring out the, 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 the way to do it and market mm -hmm. it and who to work with on it. So that's kind of like another project. Um, but I'm really kind of, you know, I'm extremely excited just because working within the Hollywood system is horrible, but I really want to get this like film, like from script to screen, which has yeah. been like the hardest challenge of anything I've ever done just because it's out of my control. Like I've done huh. everything I could in my power and now it's yeah. in the hands of other people. And mm -hmm. it's uh, it's a very long, and tedious process so um but once that happens i mean i have other ideas i'd like to just keep writing i'd like to keep doing it um i'm always guest lecturing and speaking so i you know i i'd like to go on the road and do a mm -hmm. tour if there was ever the thing like that but uh for now it's just here's a zoom link the classes at this time I'm like okay yeah, yeah. no problem yeah so what, what what is your obviously you talk about a lot of different things but like when you're speaking is there like a main message or a central message that you hope your whoever's listening come if they come out with one thing is there one thing you want them to hear depends on the audience to be honest i mean i've lectured at almost a dozen universities and, mm -hmm. I, and i mean real ones not like new jersey turnpike community college yeah, yeah, yeah. you know like real ones um it really depends because sometimes i teach to you know mbas or sometimes mm -hmm. it's entrepreneurship students or sometimes it's film students or sometimes it's just the general audience on business um I feel if there's one overriding message, it's just not waiting for permission and it's just, you know, going on that adventure. Mm -hmm. Right. And I, when I, when I give these, I talk, I incorporate a lot of psychology and philosophy and mythology and history mm -hmm. um, to illustrate the points, but it's really just too many people are just sitting around hoping for better circumstances or waiting right. for the right moment. It doesn't exist. It's, it's, it, you have to take it on your own or else you're just going to like rot like a, like, like a tree. You know, in, in a marsh, you, you really have to move forward on your own and, and go after what you want because life is extremely short and you yeah. want to take the risk and do what you want to do. Interesting. So how could people follow all this stuff, you know, on social media? Um, 
LinkedIn. I don't really spend time on social media just because I'm too busy. Um, I do post daily startup stuff on LinkedIn. Um, I don't really post a lot about what I'm working on just because it'll open the floodgates to a lot of people that they could add value, whatever that means. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I'm, I'm about uh, subtracting. So if you say add value to me, I'm subtracting you from my life. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, LinkedIn's the best. And I'm sure there'll be a link that you can click below. Um, there you go. Yeah, we can make link, that happen. Link, yeah, LinkedIn's cool. If you're connecting, just let me know why you're connecting or what you're or you've heard me on the show or if you want to do. No problem. Or else I'm just going to ignore you or assume that you're trying to sell me something I don't need, uh, yeah, yeah. which happens every day. So sure. it's, it's just just include a just say, hi, I heard you. Awesome. You're in. Done. Yeah. Well, it definitely sounds like it's been an interesting run for you so far. Well, and we're uh, just getting started. Like some more keep, stuff keep, ahead of time. We're forward, keeping it so. rolling. We're getting yeah. it together. Well, good. Well, I appreciate the time. It was good talking to you. And I wish you nothing uh, but continued success. Thanks, sir. Thank you for having me. All right. Thanks for listening, everybody. Thanks for listening to Adeptus On Air. If you like this episode, please subscribe and leave a review. The views and opinions by the podcast speakers and guests are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of Adeptus. This podcast provides general information only and is not intended to constitute advice.